Stefan Twal is CCO of Ethereum. Stefan, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Well, thank you. I did a week of shows on Bitcoin and other blockchain platforms, and after covering Ethereum, I am excited by its ambition, and I'm excited about the team, but overall, I'm skeptical of the ratio of hype to substance mm-hmm. in the dialogue around uh, Ethereum. Right. And and I don't think this is the dialogue necessarily coming from you or coming from Vitalik, but... Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so but but I I realize that I'm kind of underinformed on the topic, and I don't want to seem as a like a baseless ideologue, because um, I I don't understand Ethereum intimately. So I'm going to mm-hmm. ask some naive and basic questions that are coming from me, and then I'm also going to ask some in depth questions that were asked on Reddit and Quora, if that's okay. Excellent. Yeah, well, I didn't know there were questions on Quora too. That sounds good. Yeah, great. So. To someone who already understands Bitcoin intimately, how would you explain Ethereum? Right. So if you understand Bitcoin, pretty much Ethereum is uh, doing what Bitcoin does for money, but it does it to anything that can be mathematically represented. Uh, In a nutshell, what we're trying to do is give developers that are not advanced cryptographers, but generic web developers that know HTML and JavaScript, an opportunity to build blockchain-based applications just like Bitcoin, but not limited to currency. So, you know, being able to build something else like, um, say, complex financial applications or games, or things of that nature. So, uh, well, financial applications, for example, that sounds like something that uh, Bitcoin could already handle with with its uh, with its money based mm-hmm. platform. Is that accurate? Well, I mean, of course, you can. Um, you can actually. There's not just Bitcoin, but anything in the centralized world. Um, there's nothing that Bitcoin or Ethereum bring that the centralized world can already do probably better and cheaper. Um, what Bitcoin and Ethereum bring to, to these uh, environments is they bring decentralization. And they bring the fact that you don't have to trust in the context of Bitcoin, you don't have to trust a central bank, you don't have to trust a government to print or destroy money as they see fit. Uh, you don't have to uh, be at the mercy of uh, moving markets or, you know, like we've seen in Cyprus, sort of economic catastrophes when you use Bitcoin. So that's what Bitcoin brings. Bitcoin brings decentralization to money. Ethereum brings that to just about anything else. So when you execute code on the Ethereum network, when you call a contract, what's called a contract is a, is a piece of code on the Ethereum network. Think of it as an app, if you will. When you call that app, um, you don't rely on the creator of the app to be a trustworthy individual, just like the bank would be a trustworthy entity for money. You don't have to do that. You actually have the knowledge that this code has been verified by millions of nodes and that they entered into consensus that it will do what it says it will. So you can actually even check the code yourself if you'd like. So Ethereum talks about Turing completeness as being a core feature of the platform, but Bitcoin chooses not to have Turing completeness because of concerns around uh, com- just, you know, c- contracts potentially halting the entire system. Right. Um, so why why is Ethereum... Uh, talk about Turing completeness as a feature rather than a bug. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, well, it's certainly not a bug, uh, and it's definitely a feature. Uh, but it's not magical the way we solve this. So it's called the, the halting problem. And the idea is that any given piece of code, uh, centralized, decentralized, doesn't matter, uh, when you compile it, you can't be sure that it won't enter into an infinite loop because of various things, including compiler errors and things like that. Now, an infinite loop on a network like Bitcoin or Ethereum, of course, that would be pretty much catastrophic because uh, it would bring it to a crawl. All nodes would just be running the same nonsensical code over and over again. We don't want that. So what we do is we introduce this concept of Ether, which is like a fuel. And whenever you trigger a piece of code on the Ethereum network, you consume that fuel. Now, the amount of fuel that's consumed is proportional to the impact that you have on the network's processing power, storage requirements, etc., etc., right? Um, That means that if you were to trigger an infinite loop, which you can on Ethereum, you can just write something that's uh, similar to uh, 10 go to 20, 20 go to 10, right, if you will. You, you can, but you will run out of what's called gas, uh, run out of ether, if you will, uh, run out of fuel uh, before uh, before long. In fact, very quickly, I imagine, you'll reach what's called the block uh, gas limit, and uh, the transaction would simply fail. Now, if you were to keep it just under, you could. That's called spamming the network. And all you'll end up doing is making the miners very rich. So I think they'll be grateful, and the network will adapt. And that's about it. So why would you choose to write a new system like Ethereum 
rather than building side chains off of Bitcoin? Because uh-huh. you could conceivably construct the same interface, the same API of Ethereum by building side chains off of Bitcoin. Uh, no, it's not that simple. Um, so there are several initiatives. I believe one of them is called Blockstream that focus on sidechains. Uh, but really, the idea of sidechains is to have this two-way peg of value, right? So you have, uh, I don't know, the equivalent of 10 bucks on one chain and the equivalent of 10 bucks on another. And you can burn one in exchange of the other and so on um, in order to transfer value between chains. That says nothing about the contracts, about the ecosystem, about the user base, about the transactions that are taking place on that chain. That just means transferring value. So actually, sidechains, if they do happen on Bitcoin, eventually, I'm sure they will, um, we we'll look forward to them because that will allow contracts on Ethereum to transact in any other given cryptocurrency at the very least, um, including Bitcoin. Um, that's, you know, sidechains have nothing to do with the underlying language or how, how the network is built, how the protocol handles things. And Ethereum is not just, uh, by the way, a, a blockchain. It's a series of, uh, of protocol. So you have Ethereum, which is really the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine, the decentralized computer, if you will. You have Whisper, which is the decentralized messaging system that's darker than dark, pitch black dark, very secure. You have Swarm, the decentralized storage layer. And both Whisper and Swarm are currently in, uh, in development. Um, Swarm probably is a little bit more um, uh, getting uh, 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 more and more developed as as as, as time goes by. Uh, and Ethereum is already the VM is already launched, of course, through uh, Frontier or V1. So so it's a network of things. It's not just one uh, protocol, if you will. So is, is there something uh, about the Ethereum platform, the Ethereum API, that makes it more conceivable that those apps would be easy to write? Within Ethereum, than the 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 future sidechain ecosystem that Bitcoin will have. Well, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of a strange question, you know. Like, so this future thing that doesn't exist, yeah, it might be wonderful. Or we exist. Right. Okay. Um, but but I mean, it, it, you said it is probably going to to exist. So I mean, I, I I'm just curious, like from from a utilitarian perspective like you know you could have this this thing where we go we go off and we build ethereum and we build in uh you know functionality for all this messaging and stuff or we could or everybody could team up and all work on bitcoin Mm -hmm. uh and and just and build build the build the functionality on top of it uh, you uh, know, right. yeah. and, no, I mean, there's, there's uh, actually, you know, you can do that. Um, so, for example, uh, some of the core, so we didn't reuse, by the way, in, in any of the Bitcoin code, just so we're clear, right? Pretty sure. much, uh, I mean, it's been written from scratch. So, for example, that allowed us to introduce features like very rapid block time. So, for example, we're on a 15 second block time at the moment. Um, and we tested during the testnet phase uh, down to six seconds, but we had to increase it to 15 seconds to be a little bit more realistic and in, ensure that the network will grow nicely at the beginning. Um, Bitcoin is on 10 minutes. Now, if you were, t- you, you can't change that, you know, without forking the, th- the Bitcoin protocol, right? That's, that's what you're reading about actually these days about all these changes that the core Bitcoin developers are arguing over, you know, should we change the block size limit and this and that? Yeah. If they do that, if they do this type of changes, they're going to have the, what's called a fork. And nobody really wants a fork because their hard forks are, are uh, well, it's not something that you're after, basically. <laughs> Obviously, uh, you don't want to have half your miners on one chain and the other on the other chain, right? Um, so you couldn't uh, implement this feature in Bitcoin without severely changing the protocol. I mean, as I said, we're completely different. So the answer is no, you couldn't build on top, right? But you could work uh, alongside Bitcoin. So, like for example, what we what we have is we have this little application, which is, I think it's a daemon, so it's fairly centralized. It's probably running on a server, and it's sending um, Bitcoin for Ether it's on GitHub, um, and vice versa uh, by just having a client that talks to both chains. I mean, that's no issue at all. Sure. Okay. So, um, some questions uh, from Reddit. One question is, oh, Mister by Mister Shibx. He asks. Why did the team feel that pool mining would be impractical, and are those assumptions still valid? Right, yeah, no, that's an excellent question. So I think he's referring to some of the comments I've made uh, about the uh, pool size. When I talked to the developers, you know, the, the, the comments that I've received were that the, um, the optimal size of the pool is so small that there's, a, there's no point pooling. And also because we have a repeat, really rapid uh, block time, um, solo mining 
right, was was a thing and wasn't necessarily something that uh, people would want to move away from and enter into a pool. Now, in reality, what uh, Ethereum is, is an ideal environment for multi-pooling and smaller pools. So the optimal pool size is still obviously 100%, uh, but the gains taper off much more quickly than, say, with something like Bitcoin, for example. So there's nothing we can do about pools, right? In a sense, we can't prevent pools. What we can do is encourage the development of um, other pools. And we can also uh, continue on core improvements so that people feel that the ether, ether that they're mining um, is, is variable enough to continue investing in, in the mining. So basically nothing, nothing really different from what we're doing now. Um, and over time, the network will take care of itself. Uh, as, as I think that Christian probably refers to the fact that there's a very large pool. Uh, I think it's called Pool. <laughs> That's got like forty-one percent, something like that, today of the hashing power. So if you're listening to this and if you're on F pool, please disconnect and go to one of the alternative pools. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, okay, so this next question is good because I just did an interview with Juan Benet about IPFS. Mm. Uh, Positive Vibes Battalion asks: Will the Swarm file system support versioning in the Git-like way that IPFS does? I'm not sure about the Git like, you know, in terms of the API itself, but definitely uh, the, the, it supports already supports versioning uh, in the uh, test version that we have, and um, low level support for version versioning, if you will, by by pretty much block height. Uh, so then, if you want to have say a GitHub like API, you can definitely implement on top of that. Yes. And Technologov asks about IPFS. Also, he says. Uh, IPFS has a fundamental flaw, uh, lack of coin crypto economic incentive to store dApps. Uh, do you have any comment on that? I, I don't necessarily think that's true. Um, I, I seem to remember when I met the guys from IPFS that actually they did have an incentive layer. Um, so that's something maybe uh, uh, that readers should probably check out. Uh, now, on the other hand, Swarm does have an incentive layer for sure. Um, it's basically a court system. So you pay for storage, you pay for retrieval. Uh, the nodes uh, store a chunk. Um, uh, they, they give a receipt in exchange of this chunk. And in a nutshell, the, all the nodes that store these chunks are, are bearing the collective responsibility, right? Um, if a chunk is lost, which is obviously the, the problem that... Uh, Technology of is, is referring to, you know, what happens then? Oh, I lost my chunk. That's not acceptable, especially in the context of, say, like a, a Dropbox type app. So if the, if the chunk is lost, um, the node that give the receipt uh, are going to be at risk of losing a deposit. So it's a deposit mechanism. Uh, which they need to put up as a collateral when they store the chunk. What you can do is you can sue, which is really sending the receipt to a swarm contract. And it's a swarm contract that's on the Ethereum blockchain. So we're using, we're intertwining, if you will, swarm the, the storage protocol with Ethereum, the consensus mechanism, where needed. And uh, you can actually uh, mount a defense, if you will, if you were a node and you've been sued and you say, no, that's not true. I did not, I did not chuck away that, that chunk, if you will. And, and all you have to do is produce um, uh, the chunk in question. And uh, then the, uh, uh, the, 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 you, won't, you won't pay a fine, if you will, from the smart contract. Now, of course, if people are mounting like false attack, we also thought of that. So there's a penalty system for uh, false, false alarms. And the court system is really a last resort. Uh, you Praxic uh, says the Ethereum team incentivized testing during the Olympic phase by offering rewards of Ether to be paid out during the launch of Frontier. How effectively did that strategy drive out bugs in the spec and implementations? Uh, did you use an Ethereum contract to distribute the rewards, and how did the overall process work out? Right. Yeah. Um, I think I think it definitely helped. I mean, there's a bunch of guys who uh, are due rewards uh, that found some uh, some interesting bug. I think somebody was able to trigger a fork, so definitely it paid off. And of course, there was all the the mining uh, testing that took place, and that's an awful lot of people. Probably considerably larger number of people took part in mining than in trying to find bugs, right? Which is which is expected. We also have a bug bounty, uh, which is still ongoing, by the way. And no, none of it uses a smart contract, unfortunately, because uh, Ethereum needed 
needed to exist before Ethereum could distribute rewards through smart contracts. So that, <laughs> you know, it's a chicken and egg problem. Um, uh, in terms of the reward, at the moment, we're currently still uh, aggregating that list. Uh, we've been very busy with the launch, uh, but uh, we're not forgetting about the people who've uh, participated in the program. Far from it, we're compiling a list and we'll issue the rewards as soon as we can. Could you describe Ether and uh, go into the types of the kind of fundraising that Ethereum has raised? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. describe what it was. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, this fuel I talked to, to you about earlier, um, what we did is we pre-sold it. Right? So it didn't exist, and we said, well, people can buy as much as they want of this, of this uh, ether, this fuel. Um, they purchased it, and the total amount purchased, I think, came to something like 58, I think, million ethers, right? For various amount of uh, bitcoins, by the way. There was, a, there was um, a, a changing price, if you will. If you were to buy early, you'd get a better price than if you were to buy late, etc. And it lasted 42 days. I think it started at 2,000 ether per BTC and finished on. Uh, 1337 lit uh, ether per BTC. Um, so when uh, when that process took place, it formed the total, if you will, fuel base of the entire network. On top of which was added, um, I think it was 9.8 percent for an early contributor pool and 9.8 percent for a the foundation, the Ethereum Foundation itself. So this this was generated out of thin air, if you will on top of the amount that was purchased. Now, the, you, if you take the total of that, which I think is around 70 million, something on my, oh, actually it's around 62 million, sorry, my maths are incorrect. So around 62 million, 26% um, of that is created via mining year on year. So the first year, the inflation will receive a 26%. But the second year, if we continue on the proof of work model, um, it will still be 26% of the original sum that will be added to the entire network. So the inflation will be lower, maybe around the lines of uh, 21%, I think, something along those lines. And then the next year, 18, and the next year, 15, and the next year, 13, and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a disinflationary model, and that's pretty much how it worked. I see. So um, Celtic Warrior 72 from Reddit asks, given the amount of cash remaining from the pre-sale, what staffing levels and mix of people are anticipated over the next 12 months? I think over the next 12 months, you know, definitely refocus on development, core development, uh, definitely less staff, I imagine, uh, because there's obviously less funds. Um, I think we have enough, uh, well, found, I shouldn't say we already, it's foundation. Foundation has enough to um, go on until um, Serenity, which is our proof of stake release, um, and, and develop, obviously, the milestone in the middle, which are uh, Metropolis, um, respectively, and Homestead, sorry, Homestead and, and Metropolis, respectively, then Serenity. Uh, another question from Technologov. What are the future funding options for Ethereum dev team after 12 months? Right. Well, I mean, it's not even after 12 months, really. It's any time. Uh, foundation itself uh, is, is, is meant to go and identify um, either revenue sources, which could take many forms. I mean, I think a lot of them are pretty, pretty obvious uh, without going against our ethos. Um, or they can find donations, which is also um, a possibility. But that's up to the foundation uh, to go and decide how they want to, uh, to, to go ahead on that. They're having their first board meeting this weekend in Zug. Um, it's uh, Ming Chang, which is our executive director. Uh, Vadim, Lars, and Wayne, which are all the, uh, uh, board members. And of course, Vitalik Buterin, who is the president of the foundation that are meeting up. Hodel Dwan from Reddit asks, what are the goals over the next few months, the milestones to watch for, and what was previously planned that may be dropped or delayed due to reprioritization in light of resource constraints? That's a good question. Um, so definitely, um, uh, you know, Whisper, Swarm, they're high on the priority list. Whisper definitely is high on the uh, C++ development team list, and Swarm is high on the uh, Go development team list. Um, Mist on the Go side definitely uh, is a must. So Mist is a browser, by the way. It's a it's a decentralized application browser. It's really nifty because you're hosting not only the back end of the application uh, in the blockchain, which is decentralized, but also the front end of the application in Swarm, which is also decentralized and uh, uncensorable. So you end up with websites that can't be stopped, which is pretty exciting uh, outlook. Um, 
that's I think uh, the main priorities and I think it's quite a lot already because these are ambitious projects uh, there was a, a mention of IPFS earlier you know there's been many many other decentralized storage systems um, that people have tried to build including incentivized bit torrents and some of them were pretty interesting but none of them really went mainstream so you know the question is how do you take this uh, decentralized storage technology and you give it an API that's simple enough that people want to use it as part of their existing application but also as part of Community decentralized application. I think that's the trick. Right. So, but were there any of those milestones that I mean are going to be dropped or delayed because of uh, lighter resource constraints? Not the moment. No. I mean, all of those stuff I've listed is still on the roadmap, and we're still gunning for um, serenity. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, did you did you budget your roadmap? Uh, based on on a larger projected amount of resources, though. At the beginning, absolutely yes. I mean, I think at the beginning, um, we the total ether sold was eighteen point four million dollars, I believe. Um, but because of the devaluation of uh, Bitcoin, I think eight of that. Um, where, uh, well, the word is, I'm not sure if the word is lost, but they're definitely not there anymore. Um, so definitely, but that took place, uh, remember, this took place last year in September. So we had time to think about that and uh, think about alternates. And But so far, I think we're quite happy with the size of the development team. As I said, I think there'll be a, a refocus in the coming month on, on maybe um, uh, maybe a more core environment. Um, but uh, no, it's not affecting... Whisper, Swarm, Mist, definitely those three are definitely on the list. Mix, Mix um, I'll have to ask uh, Gavin about this, but uh, Mix is definitely still being built. I'm not sure if it's one of the priority. It might not be. I know there's a lot of um, uh, community efforts around development environments that look really, really good. Um, there's one called Cosmo. That's really cool. It's in the browser. It's done by a guy called Nick Dodson. He works for a community called Consensus. And I know they have another development environment in the works, which looks also really cool. So we'll see how that goes. You see, I mean, I mean it's, a, it's a bit of a no-brainer. You know, anything that's core, we're going to focus on. So anything that's network-related, FP2P, RLP, that type of stuff, obviously we're going to develop that first and foremost. And the stuff that's on the edges, like a development environment, well, that might not be so important. So that might get uh, delayed or dropped off. We'll see. Um, interesting. Okay. Um, if you found yourself hacked and you lost a bunch of those funds, mm. how would you re- how would you reprioritize Ethereum? Like, or or maybe let's say hypothetically, like, what if you would have raised even fewer funds and you were really light on resources? Mm. What are what are what is like? If you just had to focus on one thing exactly, what would that thing be that you would develop and abandon everything else? The EVM, the the Ethereum virtual machine. That's that's the that's really the centerpiece of the whole stack, isn't it? It's this decentralized virtual machine which uses opcode, so it's pretty much your your standard stack based virtual machine that you've learned about at uni, but it runs on um, a lot of different computers. Um, it's a it's a single ton at scale, if you will. That's I think that's what makes it very unique and very special, uh, because from there you know you get all the building blocks to build other things. Um, everything else, um, obviously, I mean, in my opinion, is is a must have because I I really believe in in the concept of the DAP and and Web three and in my opinion the the, the purpose of building Ethereum is to build a decentralized web, no less. Um, definitely an uncensorable web. Uh, with a lot more personal freedom than we're experimenting now. I think that's that's the real goal. So I think we need all that stuff around the edges. But if you were to look at it from a purely academic perspective and you had like a super tight budget, then yes, the EVM is the core thing. This is kind of a harsh question. Um, uh-huh. from, comes from Quora. Is Ethereum just a way to transfer power from banks and governments to another oligopoly of private early mm. Ethereum adopters and board members? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. No, I mean, you know, clearly not. Um, there, there's an interesting uh, anecdote. At the very beginning, when we started this stuff, I was, you know, fielding calls for various people interested in our stack and so on. And I got some pretty serious hate mail from people who were coming from a libertarian perspective and thought we were building what's called the Venus Project, which is... You know, a means of having this, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, it's quite interesting, it's by a guy called Jack Fresno, it's got this uh, very large scale computer that can monitor all the resources in the world and assign them as optimally as possible, which is kind of like our lingo, isn't it? That's how we speak when we talk about, about things, we talk about things that are optimal, we talk about distributing resources optimally and so on. 
Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, we had people from, uh, you know, maybe a more extreme, um, extreme left uh, side of things that thought we were evil and ran uh, at last shrug waving uh, libertarians that, uh, that believed into some type of uh, techno elite and, we were bringing forth the uh, the techno doom, so to speak. So um, in reality, what Ethereum is is this decentralized computer. So you know, if you use it, and uh, you can write whatever you want. And some people are going to use it for things that are legal in their jurisdiction. Some people are going to use it for things that are illegal in the jurisdiction. Some people are going to have reputation system that favor maybe, uh, I don't know, left-leaning ideas and other will uh, support right-leaning ideas or maybe even worse than that. We'll see. Um, but uh, anyone is welcome to participate. And those communities can work together on exchanging reputation systems, or resources, revenue, whatever. Um, I find that quite interesting. I think it's uh, actually, uh, if anything, instead of being for or against the current system or the banks or whatever that uh, that gentleman was talking about, I think Ethereum is more about building a third way where people can build their own systems where they feel that they're comfortable with the way things are handled completely transparently on a network that can't be taken out. I think that's cool. What is a no-nonsense metric to we- to measure whether Ethereum is successful in a year. Yeah, well, number of dApps, right? So I mean, for me, that's, that's the key metric. Um, high quality dApps as well. I'm not, you know, obviously you know, t- small student-like projects, you know, little games, little things like that. That's cool, right? We all enjoy playing with them. Uh, but if we were to have um, some pretty serious heavy duty dApps, and I'm not talking necessarily about, you know, existing developers that come and, and build teams, but uh, we've seen, and I mean, consensus in New York is a good example of that. They have this really large development team, and all they do is build um, uh, really cool dApps, uh, ranging from games to triple accounting system, so triple entry accounting system, sorry, and all sorts of very interesting stuff. Uh, and that's all they do, decentralized apps on Ethereum. I think that's brilliant. Um, if you, if you, if you have more like that, there's also Augur, which is a, uh, a decentralized prediction market. They have a pretty serious team. From what I've heard, they were, they were funded with uh, proper money as well. Um, that excites me because I'm thinking, you know, we're going to see high production value type apps. Uh, which obviously are going to be a lot more attractive to the mainstream public than includes, say, my kids or my wife or my mom, maybe one day, I'm not sure, um, than something that's a little bit more academic and, you know, green text on a black background that's exciting for me, but I'm not sure it's very exciting for the rest of the world. So if we can see some uh, high-quality dApps that bring real value to people and you end up in a, in a situation where people say, oh, what's this? You know, I want to I wanna go and have a play with that. Oh, it's called Ethereum. Download Mist as their browser. I think that's uh, that would be a great metric. If on the other hand it's uh it's it's a desert and you have uh, crickets riding tumbleweeds in there then we did something wrong. <laughs> okay. Um Philip BR from Reddit asks from a risk management point of view what are the key risks and what mitigation strategies have been put in place? Gosh, uh, sounds these are pretty tough questions, isn't it? <laughs> I know, no <laughs> kidding. Wow, it's like, you know... You Reddit, know Reddit's board. kind of a tough place. It's a tough yeah, crowd. It's, it's like board meeting. I imagine all these people wearing suits asking me all these questions. <laughs> uh, it's a bit scary. Um, well, I mean, I think the, the biggest risk um, was, you know, will this thing launch or not? And I think a lot of people made that very clear to us <laughs> when, when we were building it. Um, and it did launch in its frontier mode. Now we have uh, Homestead coming next. Uh, the good news is a lot of the things, a lot of the problems we thought we'd have with uh, Frontier um, didn't materialize. Um, so, for example, when Frontier started, you know, there was this sort of event where everyone had to wait for a certain hash, uh, so a random number, if you will, to appear on the test net and then enter it into the live net to, to trigger the, the genesis of, of Ethereum, right? And we were concerned that the network on the test net would fork uh, rapidly. Um, it would restructure itself over time and reorg and people would enter the wrong number and would have 20 different Ethereum and that would be no good. And it didn't happen. It was actually a really soft, uh, smooth launch. Now, today we had an event where we had a consensus error for three hours. And that was pretty poor. Uh, but we had put in place 
uh, various uh, security mechanisms. Some of them worked and some of them didn't. And so we learned a big lesson today. I think the Canaries didn't work, for example. That's a shame. Uh, but that's why we have Frontier. Frontier is still an alpha. People need to remember that. Um, on the other hand, other, other process like uh, notifying the exchanges, for example, or, or notifying the users, and we felt went quite, quite well today. I think we informed people quite rapidly. The get clients were 50% of them were updated within, I think it was within an hour. So that's actually uh, quite, quite impressive considering that it took a lot longer to upgrade from 1.0 to 1.01. Um, so we try wherever we can to put those systems in place. Uh, but you know, soon we'll, uh, We'll take away the training wheels when, with Homestead. We'll take away the canaries, which are basically contracts, by the way, where mining stops if one of the dev well, some a quorum of developers decide to um, to well realize not decide realize that there's a problem with consensus. So mining mining ends, if you will, on that particular fork. We'll we'll take that out, and the network will be completely decentralized, and we'll have no control over it, which is the way it was always intended. Um, that comes with a certain amount of risk, definitely. I mean, if you look at Bitcoin, they. They've been out there for six years, something like that, I think now, and they had a couple of issues. Uh, they recovered. We learned a lot from them, um, and that's that. Definitely. Um, so uh, another kind of uh, harsh question. You probably think about this, but uh, I'll, I guess I'll ask, in what sense do you think about it? Um, yeah, like in what sense do you think about liability like let's say in a year it is crickets writing tumbleweeds mm. and and you know uh price of ether is shot down right um do you worry about getting kind of labeled as a uh mm. i hate i mean a scam coiner or right, like right. do you do you worry about legal risk um Oh damn! Yeah, I mean, if that's a, if that's a scam, it's a pretty lame one because I've been working my butts off, and I know the rest of the team. Right? It's it's been not it's not butts really... off for eighteen months. So exactly, we, it we wouldn't really be a scamming. scam. Yeah, no, we, it's yeah. exactly. <laughs> I I shouldn't use the I probably shouldn't use the word scam. No, but, but I see I see what you're referring to. I mean, it's very common in what's called the crypto community. You know, the, everything's a scam if it doesn't if something has not delivered on you know um, some type of return or something like that or didn't deliver one hundred percent of their promise then it's a scam i mean it's a bit of a i don't know to me it's a bit juvenile really um it's it, no it's, i don't disagree with you but let's like this the stakes i would say the stakes if i were in your spot the stakes for me i would be like oh, okay this is worrisome because if, if if this doesn't work out investors lose money uh you know government comes after me they're like what is this uh you know this crypto thing we have no idea and then you you give them an honest defense and they just don't buy it i mean that would worry me liability wise Mm, no, I mean that's not what keeps me awake at night. No, I mean I, I have I have um, see, I've written a blog post which I keep on forgetting to post about uh, all the ways Ethereum could die, and I, I and I wrote it because I thought it was it was quite interesting because it's none of it is what people talk about. So you know people talk about all sorts of things that actually are slightly nonsensical about how it could end, but I can think of some really really doomsday type scenarios for Ethereum that no one seems to really be worried about. I'm concerned about them. I mean, I'll, I'll give you one. I don't think it's a it's a big secret, but you know what what if you know what makes Ethereum really special is the fact that we we as a team um, decided to go and build this thing on the principle of openness and uh, more importantly that it would not be something that could be censored very easily actually it would be very hard to censor in fact down to the point where if somebody was to do something bad on Ethereum you'd have to do your job you know to go and find them out it would not be straightforward if possible at all so that's to, that's to us is sort of one of the critical aspects of it now someone if this and you, I think you can tell, you know, this, this sort of field is really popular. You mentioned at the beginning there's a lot of hype, right? Uh, unfortunately, we're hearing a lot of big names looking into this stuff. Now, if, if a Google or something like that decides, hey, this is pretty cool, um, and build something that's like Ethereum, but not quite, you know, it's missing out on all the the privacy feature, for example, or maybe a lot of it sends data to the NSA, for example. No one will know because we'll be completely forgotten because we're just tiny. You know, we're this tiny organization with 30 people and Google has, I don't know how many thousands of employees and a gigantic marketing department or, you know, right now it's been mostly myself, George and Ken picking up the phone, you know. Um, so we don't stand a chance against these guys that could come up, roll up some sort of pseudo decentralized solution and advertises as such, um, I will be forgotten. I'll be the end of it. I think uh, I think that'll be pretty sad. 
but it's 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 a potential it's it's something that keeps me up awake a little bit at night yeah yeah um and i don't mean to sound like a uh like a fear-mongering uh you know person who who thinks you shouldn't build technologies that have some element of risk in it um i was just interested in getting some of your uh empathetic approach um so uh to continue the theme of harshness uh an anonymous user on i'm glad you called asked, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah i'm sure you you're welcome to uh to do a skype interview with with me about all all that awful things that uh that you could ask about me there's plenty of plenty of things you could ask that would that would embarrass me no. um but anyway so so an anonymous user on quora wrote an answer advocating a quote professional management team come in and take over for vitalik and i'll say as a quick point that i th- think this is a terrible idea uh, i mean i'm a pretty big fan of vitalik uh obviously this is a difficult project and uh you know it's not like a professional management team is gonna have any better idea how to run it than vitalik um but the anonymous user does make some salient points so we should go through them um the first is quote vitalik was wrong about not hedging the bitcoin raised in the pre-sale an almost fatal mistake actually end quote what are your opinions on that um, well, first of all, I mean, I think it's inc- it's a personal attack, isn't it, on Vitalik? I mean, the bottom line is Vitalik did not unilaterally at the time make the decisions to hold on to Bitcoin. It was a group decision to hold on to the Bitcoin. In fact, if you remember, and if Mr. Anonymous and Cora remembers, there was a lot of people accusing us of so-called dumping the Bitcoin, as if, I think if somebody even accused us, many people accused us of crashing the Bitcoin market by selling it, even though it was all in a multi-sig that was publicly accessible, auditable and they could see we're not touching it um so you know you 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 can't win right really um i thought at the time you know that decision wasn't a bad one we didn't want to crash the btc market we knew we could because we had enough to really bring the price down to 20 bucks or something like that uh i think somebody did the math um (laughs) and we didn't why because we're not against bitcoin i mean most of us are bitcoiners from from back in the days um or started discovering this technology certainly i did from uh by discovering bitcoin first um so that would be a terrible thing to do no i mean i don't think it was necessarily uh, such a horrible mistake you know thank you for the 2020 hindsight uh, next time send me also the lottery, uh, <laughs> the lottery ticket numbers you know because i need to know them you know it was a terrible idea not to use the lo- the winning lottery ticket numbers wasn't it <laughs> okay, so maybe maybe this anonymous isn't as informed as I uh, appreciate or at- anticipated. But uh, another point he made, um, he said, "quote Vitalik was wrong when he." Al- oh, and by the way, the name of this uh, thread is uh, "What was Vitalik Buterin wrong about?" <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need to send me a link. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah, I'll send it across. Pretty, to- yeah. pretty harsh. <laughs> um, so Vitalik. So another point, Vitalik was, quote, wrong when he allowed the project to get sidetracked with multiple implementations of geth and eth and wasting precious resources on diversions such as Whisper and Swarm. Uh, and I'm guessing since you you already said you're still working on Whisper and Swarm, you kind of disagree with the premises of this. Well, but- I mean, no, geth and eth, uh, just that. Um, well, I mean, I... <laughs> I stand. Uh, I think. I, I think if he, if this uh, gentleman looks at what happened today, he would have found out that actually having more eth nodes, if we had a fifty-fifty equilibrium between eth and geth node, or actually even better, a thirty-three percent, so well around thirty-three percent eth, thirty-three percent geth, thirty-three percent pi eth, would have actually solved a lot of issues today. Right? We wouldn't have had this consensus troubles uh, because the issue was in geth, not in eth or pi eth. Um, so no, absolutely not. It was a good idea to have multiple implementations. Um, it wasn't obvious at the beginning of the project, just like many of the things are, uh, to people outside of the project. Man, I personally could see why it was useful because I could see, you know, Jeff was the guy who was writing the Go code. He was climbing the chain, so to speak, up to block, say, 1000. And then uh, Gavin, who's writing the C++ code and now leading the C++ team, was climbing it to 1001. And then they were wondering, well, why is that? And they would discover a bug uh, in the core protocol and it'd fix it. And then they'll do it again and again and again and again until the thing was climbing up to 300,000, a million, and so on. 
and we knew we had a working protocol. Um, I think it's really useful to have multiple implementation. I think we, I think it also keeps people honest. Um, it allows uh, multiple implementations to be audited by you know lots of different sets of eyes. I, mean, I, I can't read C++. You know, I'm a Java guy. Um, I have no idea what the C++ implementation does. Now, if there's an Ethereum in, in J, and there is, I can have a look at it and I can say, well, that's wrong or that's right or let's do this better and so on. I think it's useful. Um, as for Swarm and Whisper. You're not going to have a decentralized web without these things now. So if you think, well, you know, this is just a, a blockchain anyway, then sure, yeah, of course you don't need them. But that was never the. I mean, if you read what you know the, the white paper again, you can find that actually that was never the case. It's always been about you know more than that. Right. Um, so the final point that this anonymous user makes is uh, Vitalik was wrong when deciding how to allocate millions of ether to early contributors. Uh, so this sounds like a pretty subjective thing, but maybe maybe you have a, a perspective on it. I have my perspective on it, but I'm not going to answer that question. You won't answer it. No. Okay, so so you're implying that Vitalik was wrong. <laughs> next question. Okay, next question. Fine. Uh, so. What are the biggest flaws and benefits of Ethereum? Hmm. Well, the biggest benefit is that what it does, it can't be done elsewhere. Um, I think that's really, really special. Um, I can't think of any other technology you can say that about. You know, when people say, well, do you have a competitor or do you have, you know, something that does something roughly like you? And the answer is, is a resounding no in this case. And especially with uh, Whisper and Swarm, once they'll be deployed in something like Metropolis or Serenity, um, I think it'll be a truly special platform that the world has never seen before. A uh, completely uh, decentralized web that no one can censor and anyone can go and build an application and people only pay for what they use and nobody can raise artificial barriers to, com to competition on it and nobody can shut it down. And it works the same in Iran that it works in China or France or the UK. I think that's what makes it special. Um, downsides of it, um, yeah, there's, 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 there's many. I mean, the biggest downside, in my opinion, at the moment, is the friction that's um, the friction that's required uh, when you first uh, try an Ethereum DApp. So, for example, say you hear from a friend that the new Angry Birds is a really, really fun game. Uh, all you need to do is pretty grab your phone, and it probably doesn't really matter if you're Android or, or iOS, right? You can pretty download the new Angry Birds and have fun with it. Um, with Ethereum, the problem with that is if somebody says, hey, look at this cool dApp, um, and someone then tries to install Mist, uh, let's say Mist is out, or Frontier in this case, um, well, they need Ether, right? And there lies the problem. Now they need to go and find Ether. So they can mine, but let's face it, my mom is not going to mine. Um, we could try to build a client so that um, they mine by default maybe 5% GPU, but then that wouldn't be really bringing anything because people are going to want more Ether to go and play with these games and so on from the get-go. They won't understand why it stops after a while, right? So it needs to be really transparent and user-friendly. Um, and I think the other option is, of course, going on an exchange and then purchasing some. But that's not exactly simple. I mean, I don't know if you try to buy Bitcoin. I'm sure you did. But I know that for me in England, it's not easy. I mean, I have few options in England in terms of exchanges. Um, a lot of people decide to use uh, what's called Bitstamp. That's like in Slovenia. So you have to wire money to Slovenia. Can you imagine having to wire money to Slovenia every time you wanted to try the new Angry Birds? Right, so I think that's the for me that's the biggest friction point, and that's something that I'd really like to see addressed um, as part of our research in terms of what we could do around contract subsidies and things of that nature. You know, maybe advertising network that could uh, uh, provide a layer for people to gain a small amount of ether to get going. You know, that could be cool um, as long as obviously it's not intrusive. Um, the other, the other limitation is scale, right? So that's another thing we haven't talked about. So yeah, this is all nice and wonderful, but uh, at the moment, no blockchain in this world scales. Um, so that's, you know, if you think about it, that's a problem. How big of a problem is it is the real question. So Bitcoin doesn't scale either, um, but it doesn't matter. It's still useful to me as an individual because I use Bitcoin regularly uh, to buy various uh, types of things, and the fact well, that well, it, it will scale with Lightning networks, right? Yeah, well, yeah, but at the moment it doesn't, does it? 
I mean, White Lightning networks, when they aren't, they, it might, but at the moment it does not. So um, when it do, when, let's say it doesn't ever happen, let's say, right, it's still useful to me uh, because at two transactions per or seven transactions per second, it's still useful for an awful lot of people. It still has value. I still want to contribute to the development, say, of Bitcoin and its, and its, uh, sort of, you know, it, it's, it's continuous, it continued existence. So same thing for Ethereum, even though Ethereum itself scales considerably more from the get-go because we're able, obviously, to learn from six years worth of Bitcoin history, right? Um, that said, like you said, um, Lightning Networks, I mean, there's other things, right? I mean, I remember micropayment channels or something along those lines uh, with, with Bitcoin and lots of people, very smart people are looking into it. Why? Because it, it, it's exciting, it has value, and so people are trying to improve it all the time. The same is true for Ethereum. You know, it doesn't scale just like Bitcoin, but over time it will. So we're so, building, um, for example, like clients, you know, at the moment. Um, that's another focus of our research. And then Vitalik has written a couple of articles on how he imagine how, you know, this stuff could scale long term. So uh, I, I, not to harp on this, but I kind of want to come back to this, uh, the question that you didn't want to answer. Um, we, you don't need to tell me uh, an answer to it, but maybe you could explain some context to why uh, it's a touchy question or why it's inappropriate. The question about wh whether B Vitalik was wrong in deciding to allocate millions of Ether to early contributors. I mean, I, I literally have no idea why that why that's an unanswerable question. Uh, Just simply because be I'm naive. Simply because there is a thread on Reddit at the moment which discusses this, and I've made my position clear um, as to you know various things. But the problem is, like many things in this world, they're not necessarily directly related to this particular point, but more to other administrative matter which we're trying to address at the moment. And because we're trying to address them at the moment, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to discuss them. Now, when that's addressed, then I'll be more than happy to address it. <laughs> you know, simple as that. Uh, I mean, I, I kind of understand, but like at the same time, it seems sort of like a non-transparent uh, defense. And I mm -hmm. think of Ethereum as this like highly, almost religiously transparent uh, platform. So could you give any more insight as to why you can't answer that? Sure, because I personally believe that that list should have been made public and transparent. And clearly I'm overruled in that in that topic uh, as part of the organization. Ah. So I personally, you know, I'm totally agreeing with you here. I personally think all the names should be public. I'm on that list, by the way. So, you know, I'm cool with that. Um, by the way, none of the, uh, the, the, the reason also why it's a bit of a non-issue is because none of this ether has been sort of taken out, if you will, from the Ethereum pre-sale, right? It's all been generated on top of. So nobody's got, you know, their ether taken for someone else and whatever, you know, this is not the case at all. It's more about, you know, the, how do you address transparent governance? And as I said on that thread on Reddit, um, forgot my exact words, but I said it was, um, one of those, um, uh, What's the word? That's no, not reference. It's um, you know one of those topics that people will go back on and and study as uh, how good of a job we did in being transparent. And I think we can always do a, a, a better job in being transparent. I mean, I myself am for complete, hundred percent total open transparency of everything. Interesting. Uh, would you would you take that to the extreme of like? Because uh, like I know like Stripe, they they have they take this to the extreme where they like make their internal email threads public like i think, I think <laughs> wow they, they, yeah they take it to like an absurd extreme so if if you could would you would you make the ethereum project like would you make the the internal emails transparent also no and i'll tell you why because um if i've learned something in the last year and a half is people will take whatever you know they'll take that non-answer i just gave you and they'll twist you twist it three times around and they'll end up with some reddit post somewhere i'm sure i look forward to it um you know, <laughs> and and it's actually not very productive at the end of the day you know the devs want to devs i want to i want to help translate those concepts into something anybody can enjoy and have you know, a strategy as to how to make Ethereum mainstream. That's what I'm into, you know. Um, the problem with sort of the Parker, oh, why can I say that? You know, some of the parts of the community or parts of the crypto community, especially from maybe the altcoin side, you know, have a completely different view on things and sort of, you know, there's, there's a bit of a nasty vibe coming out of certain subreddits. And I, so far, I think we've been 
very lucky because our community has been brilliant. Um, if you look at the forums that we have, I think we're on 150,000 page views. We had to ban 17 people in a year and a half, I mean, one seven, right? Can you imagine that? That's just, I mean, to me, that blows my mind, you know, that we were able to have some amazing community like this. And then, yeah, when we moved, uh, you know, when you look at the Reddit, unfortunately, recently, we probably are on a 200 ban count right now because people are just, you know, posting whatever, you know, over and over on the Reddit to try to, to suck up that energy, you know, from us, uh, suck up that, that creative energy. And uh, unfortunately, at times, they've been pretty successful. Um, so that's something we had to learn to, to deal with. And I think none of us was prepared for it. Um, I certainly wasn't, but we're learning. How much momentum does Ethereum have in terms of metrics? Um, well, like social media metrics? Uh, no, I mean like, well, uh, like currently like dApps created right. or, uh, financial numbers, you know, how is the, how is the, uh, you know, ether, pr I, I know the ether price is not a perfect proxy for, uh, you know, f for for how successful, how much momentum you have, but um, I think it's a reasonable reasonable proxy. All right, so let's see. Uh, we're on block uh, one hundred seventeen thousand right now. Um, we got a oh, very low uh, giga hash rate of uh, forty seven point nine giga hash. Uh, for some reason, that probably dropped out because of the issue uh, that we had this afternoon. Now, this all the stats are available, by the way, on stats.fdev.com. And it's a sample of the nodes. Now, the thing is, we don't have a, a total number of nodes on the network. What we do is we make the uh, node reporting come really voluntarily. So people will have to go and voluntarily uh, input their their uh, details in that system in order to appear, right? So I don't know how many nodes are on this list, but it's definitely the full list. Um, we have, I think, 82 dApps or dApp developers. Um, that's based on a website. Uh, called Ethercast. I think it's daps.ethercast.com and they have a nice website where you can browse all the daps and so on. A lot of it in my, you know, is, is, is very early days. Um, so don't expect, you know, beautiful graphics and so on. Um, others, on the other hand, like Ogre, for example, are pretty advanced and um, uh, already, in my opinion, completely usable. Um, so yeah, you can have a look at that. It's early days, actually. That's a, actually, let me go back to that point because that's, that's an interesting one, that is. Um, for me, Ethereum, and for everybody who's been around that community, Ethereum is a year and a half old, and that's a long time. You know, we've, been, we've been really working our butts off, and I think everyone is, is, was very pleased to see V1 out. But the reality is that this is a project that's, in fact, three weeks old, right? Um, and... That's that's still I'm still struggling to wrap my head around that. It's it's incomplete, literally Genesis, like the name says, and uh, people should have expectations around that. You know, the fact that it's actually three weeks old and we're still growing. You know, it's this little egg. It's very fragile, <laughs> and uh, it's gonna grow slowly. Um, you know, I don't think I ever said that the world will be transformed when Ethereum launch and go full decentralized. I think this will take a long time. And it's not just technology. It's how people relate to money, how people relate to, you know, authorities and systems, uh, websites. Do they even care about this decentralized stuff? Do they care about privacy? I think a lot of them do. Um, but that's that remains to be seen. So early days, really, Frontier as well is a uh, is still uh, pretty much a, a beta, right, of uh, of our software. Um, I think Homestead is the one that you could count as sort of the proper uh, no canary contract embedded type network. Great. Um, so you know, I I, I want uh, to 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 kind of put a, an 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 end to this uh, conversation. Um, you know, I, I am a fan of, of what you guys are doing. I think it's great. Um, I just I I felt like the uh, the critical viewpoint of Ethereum was underserved relative to the hyper bullish viewpoint, and that was uh, that was the motivation for wanting to do uh, an episode that was that was uh, mostly mostly critical. Um, just because you know, I I listen to a lot of podcasts, and every podcast I found was kind of. Um, you know, future utopian yeah. Uh, per, yeah. Per perspective perspective on 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 Ethereum. And li look, I'm I'm as much of a futurist as the next um, the next honest person. Uh, but uh, you know, I think it's 
we just don't want people we if if people are going to throw uh, some portion of their savings into ethereum or or into bitcoin or whatever mm. uh i think it's 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 you know it's important to 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 uh to highlight some of the uh some of the risks and and i i want to applaud you for being so transparent and uh and willing to discuss this stuff i think you know uh i think one of the things andreas antonopoulos says is that with this the 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 people that are you know it's always clear that you know that they're scammers in advance are the ones who will get hyper defensive when you when you when you try to criticize them you're like hey clearly there's like a question here an unanswered question Mm -hmm. and they get super defensive and they're like why are you criticizing me um but you didn't do that you know you you were you were very open to these questions even welcoming so uh so that makes me really optimistic about the project well thank you i appreciate that and i hope we uh one one thing also people um don't probably don't realize um that I'm conscious of is that ultimately this we're, we're just the um, um, the curators of this code base. Right? It's just remember it's LGPL for the code base, so anyone's welcome to come and grab it and do a better job than us. It doesn't belong to us. It never has. So um, I find that that's that's interesting. Uh, interesting thing about Ethereum. It's not a company. I think somebody once said, "Oh, Ethereum, the company." Well, it's actually there is no. If you look it up, there's no company. There is a there's a foundation in Zug, and there's FDev, which is the development arm from which I receive a, a paycheck in the UK, which is a CIC in the UK. Um, so that's a very different model than anything else. I, I don't think there's anything, there's ever been anything like this. And so we're all learning and, you know, it's, uh, it's a little bit dizzying as well, but yeah, it's fun. That's great, Stefan. Um, and, uh, hopefully sometime in the future, um, maybe, I don't know, with you or with somebody else, we can do a show that's more focused on the, uh, on the development aspects of, uh, Ethereum, the the engineering aspects. Uh, I would have loved to get into other stuff, Merkle DAGs and whatnot. Um, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, we're so. gonna have a lot of fun. Huh? <laughs> okay, great. So, uh, so Stefan Stefan Twal, thanks for coming on to a particularly harsh edition of Software Engineering Daily. No worries. Thank you very much, Jeff. Appreciate okay. It. Yeah. Thanks a ton, Appreciate and I'll see you on Quora. Cheers. Bye bye. Okay.